and now I have to take care of my vagina as well, <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> think about how much time we spend here, right? And like, think about like how much upkeep we really need down there. And this is just part of that. You know, we should be really treating our, our vaginas much more like we treat our faces. Hey friends, welcome to Keep It Simple Sexy. I'm Christine Bullock, founder of KO Body Care, certified fitness trainer and mom of two little girls who's just trying to juggle it all and feel as good as possible. I'm so grateful that you're here. Now let's get started, sexy. Hi everyone, welcome back to Keep It Simple Sexy. My name is Christine Bullock and I pee my pants a little bit when I do jumping jacks, sneeze, cough, or giggle too hard. And the funny thing is that I hear this common complaint of most of my clients and my girlfriends who have had natural deliveries. But why should we just live with this embarrassing postnatal issue? In fact, when I found out I was pregnant again, I was on a mission to find someone who could help me before it got worse with the growth of this baby. I figured I would be peeing my pants all the time. In addition, this time around, I quickly had other pregnancy issues come up like diastasis recti and more. Well, luckily, I found expert Dr. Heidi Gassler. Dr. Heidi Gassler is the founder of Mountain to Sea Physical Therapy in Manhattan Beach, and she specializes in orthopedic and pelvic floor physical therapy and treats patients of all genders and life stages. So today, so today we're going to break down prenatal care and prevention along with postnatal repair. There will be the word vagina said a lot. So uh, perhaps throw in your earbuds on this one. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gassler. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining. I'm so excited to bring you here because you've been such a blessing to my life. And I think that a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, yes, we deal with like prenatal issues and postnatal issues, but this is also an aging issue for women too, as we start to break into some of the pelvic floor, even the diastasis recti, whether you've had baby or not, some, you know, a lot of people can have tears based on fitness too. Sure. Um, and so I know that it's something that you feel really passionate about in your business and are open to talking about. So I appreciate it. We can say the word vagina as much as you want. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, too, I was just out with my girlfriends two nights ago, and all they wanted to hear about was everything that we're about to talk about today. <laughs> so Great dinner conversation. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it really, we just said the V word a lot. That's all we talked about. We're all, we had, there was like 12 kids between us, so we, we needed to... To, to hash start it out. Young. And that's what we're going to do today. <laughs> we start them young. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get started. Um, I guess I want to start at that. We're going to start prenatally here for mm -hmm. a second and start with the basics of movement during pregnancy, because it is something that I personally hear about a lot. And I would love to hear your opinion. One major question and concern I get all the time is women asking whether they can exercise through pregnancy and what types they can do. Do you have any recommendations for healthy pregnancies? Sure. So kind of my kind of main take on this is that as you're, if you, um, if you become pregnant, you know, number one, birth is an athletic event and you should treat it that way. You know, so if you think about how long most women normally labor, it can be anywhere from 24, 36 hours. And if you think about how long, like the normal, like Ironman triathlon is, <laughs> birth is actually like longer athletic event than like an Ironman triathlon is. Oh, so you gosh. should really be treating birth as an athletic event. So I truly believe people should be exercising and keeping fit as much as they can through a pregnancy and as much as their bodies will allow. And my general rule of thumb is if you've been doing this up into the time that you're pregnant, you can continue to do those same activities through pregnancy and you may need to modify them a bit, but you can continue those things through pregnancy as long as it feels good in your body. I don't necessarily recommend that people jump into something new in their fitness. So if somebody <laughs> hasn't been doing anything, you know, it might not be the best time to say, join CrossFit and when they become pregnant. But if you've been doing CrossFit, you can certainly continue that into pregnancy with some modifications. Um, other things I really recommend is prenatal yoga, that's a really good thing because it helps you to keep your body strong 
really be in touch with what your body is doing and also work on helping people with breath work. That's really important for when we're having a natural delivery. And so that's something that people can incorporate whether or not they've been doing fitness or not uh, working up to their pregnancy. Uh, I love that. And that means I never have to do an Ironman because I've done it before in my life. You have. <laughs> and I have one coming up. <laughs> but people never think of it that way. You know, people it's think, so oh, true. God, I can't do anything and I need to protect. And in certain instances, if you have a really high risk pregnancy or if you're having a lot of issues, maybe you do have to, you know, do a lot more resting. And there are those cases. But for normal kind of healthy pregnancies, we want people to stay moving and active and fit because the stronger you are going into that delivery, the easier that's going to be. Yeah. And you know, that's great to hear too. I hear so many women who get really nervous um, when they've had issues getting pregnant and now they're mm. pregnant for the first time, even though it's a healthy pregnancy. Look, I have been there. You know, you guys have all heard my fertility journey on this podcast, but even the last time around um, with Penelope, I still wanted to move because I just knew the blood flow. You know, maybe I was a little bit more gentle at first in the first trimester than I was in the second. Um, but I wanted that blood flow. I wanted that, you know, m mindfulness, all of that kind of stuff for the baby as well. Stress release, all of that. Instead of just, Definitely. I hear some women, they're just like, I can't work out. I can't move. I don't want to do anything. And it's, yeah. you know, with a healthy pregnancy. And so. as we know, during the first trimester, there's always a higher risk of miscarriage. I mean, that's just always, mm -hmm. that's just the thing during first yeah. trimester. And so you want to make sure that you're following the medical advice of your doctor. You know, once you kind of get into second trimester, if you're wanting the help of the pelvic floor PT to help to direct your exercise for you and allow you to kind of have more confidence, that's part of what we're here for during the pregnancy stages is to help you to feel more confident and what's appropriate for your body and help you through that. So that's something that you could be using someone like myself for during pregnancy to help to make a pregnancy easier to, um, as well. And I oftentimes work with people's trainers because they may have a trainer or a coach that they work with who doesn't have a lot of pregnancy experience. So mm -hmm. I can help guide them and make sure that they're staying safe in their workouts as well. I love that. And honestly, it's, I mean, I'm so passionate about that. Uh, we'll go into this in a, in a second, but like I trained under doulas for my mm -hmm. fitness with a specialty program. And that was, and I had trained under just like the normal kind of fitness program pre and postnatal. I had also gotten it through Pilates, but nothing gave the information and the preparation that these doulas provided me in mm -hmm. the, you know, preparation. And it is, I mean, that's a sad thing that I see in the fitness world is they're like, well, I'll be a pre and postnatal specialist. And it is such a basic training. And to see some of the stuff that they're doing, it's a little scary, to be honest, you know, there just needs to be a better preparation. It's not their fault. It's really like the certification programs, there needs to be uh, a bit more development. So I would say go see an expert in that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, people don't realize that just because their trainer is an expert in training, it doesn't mean that they're yeah. an expert in training pregnant people. So sometimes you need a little bit more direction. Yeah, totally. Well, most women also complain of pelvic, hip, and low back pain. What type of physical therapy techniques do you recommend that women can do at home to support so, this? So, yeah. So, I mean, there's a number of different things that could be causing that pain. Um, one of the things that I find for a lot of people is that they just are developing during pregnancy really poor posture. And so working on posture with people and working on that can be something that alleviates a lot of um, a lot of pain for people and working on just gentle movements that they can do at home. If you think about when we're pregnant, how our abdomen wants to kind of pull us forward and we kind of get that big expansion. So our ribs want to kind of elevate our pelvis tips forward. And we get that sway in our low back. Well, number one, that kind of compresses our low back, compresses around the back of our sacrum and we can get a lot of that backside pain. Mm -hmm. And then on the front side, that really puts a lot of pressure on our pubic symphysis on the front side. So if you're kind of getting that front low pain, sometimes it's described as lightning crotch, you know, we can work with people on doing exercises to help with um, doing like a posterior pelvic tilt. So helping to literally reverse that. And they may not be able to stay there all the time, yeah. but working on doing posterior pelvic tilts, whether that's standing, maybe on an exercise ball, also working with people just simply in a mirror to work on finding kind of a more level, nor more neutral rib cage and pelvis and trying mm -hmm. to kind of maintain that position. Because a lot of people just don't realize that they are like that all day long and how much kind of impingement and pressure they're getting just from really poor posture. Um, another thing is that I 
recommend pregnancy belts to my patients all the time. And there's definitely a lot of debate about, um, about these amongst pelvic floor PTs, but I find that with my clients that if they're wearing one during pregnancy, they're helping to alleviate some of these pressures and pain. And there's always this concern of reliance. Like, am I going to become reliant on this belt? And my thought is once baby comes out and this pressure comes off, the need for this thing goes away. So there's no natural reliance that builds up on this belt. And you're not becoming weak because this thing is just kind of almost acting as like external abs to help hold you and alleviate some of that pressure and can really be relieving for a lot of patients if they're having a lot of that low back and hip pain. And do you, is there a time where you would start it? When Generally? people start experiencing discomfort okay. and that can okay. be anywhere. Like sometimes it's end of first trimester, people are already having that pain. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like two weeks before delivery. I mean, it can be anywhere in that spectrum. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of, you're thinking about how can I make my body more comfortable? And if you think about this, we hear a lot about how babies can read our emotions and they feel our emotions when they're in mm -hmm. utero. So yeah. imagine like if you're in pain all the time, if baby's kind of feeling that distress, why do that to yourself? Why do that to baby? Why potentially make this experience for both of you more challenging? So if you can be doing something as simple as wearing one of those pregnancy belts and feeling more comfortable, why wouldn't you do that and just make it life a little easier? Yeah, on everybody. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And just I feel like as women, as moms, we're always thinking about somebody else too. So maybe that's the step right. we need to hear to take care of ourselves. It sounds almost too simple, but it's like just no, try one. And they don't work for everybody, but it's like give it a shot. Yeah. And I used it so at the many end of them. my last pregnancy and I loved it. I had like the yeah. Velcro ones basically. And it was just there to really, mm -hmm. it just felt like so much. I didn't have so much back pain, I don't believe, but it was just like the pressure. And I love, mm -hmm. I recently heard too, that it's called lightning crotch. <laughs> yeah. And then people decide that because it's literally like shooting pain yeah. down and it's miserable. Yeah. So. I've already had it this time around, which I'm like, great. <laughs> too early for that. I know. <laughs> so, all right. So one other issue that I've actually come to um, see you about is the diastasis recti. It's a major, mm -hmm. it's a common issue uh, with most women, it, even if just a little bit. And I thought I hadn't had it the last time around. Somebody actually mm -hmm. checked me post-pregnancy, post-delivery last time. And they're like, yeah, you, you have no separation. You look great. Um, but I, and I really didn't have any coning last time around too, but I was shocked this time around, super early on, like three months or so, I was already seeing that coning mm -hmm. and I didn't even have that much belly yet. Um, so I was shocked to see that I have it and it, it just started to get worse. So that was an issue that I brought to you immediately. What is diastasis recti for people who don't know? Because I have mm -hmm. met 50, 60 year olds who didn't realize that's what they had, you know, sure. from pregnancy before. And how, how can a woman diagnose herself if possible, and uh, like what signs should be she be looking for? Sure. So first of all, um, diastasis recti is a separation of the abdominal muscles and kind of a separation right to left. Okay, so if you can envision that like thought uh, that look of like the six pack muscle, and you can imagine how we have those kind of if you look at a drawing, there's like those white lines that divide the six pack, the middle white line that goes down literally starts at the low ribs, it goes down to the pubic symphysis, so way down to the front of the pelvis, that line is literally connective tissue. And it's not muscle, it's fascial tissue. So it's a connective tissue. And what happens is as we grow, have a growing belly, our abdomen is spreading, is growing, and then things have to spread side to side. So a diastasis is literally that separation and spread of the abdominal muscles. Now, this is a natural process. And this is something I want to emphasize because everyone goes, Oh my God, something's wrong. Well, listen, if your abs don't spread while babies are growing, your baby's going to crush is going to crush your organs. <laughs> you, you have to have some spread. There isn't enough room for your uterus to literally go from like the size of an apple to the size of a watermelon without some side to side expansion. Like that just happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that as that spreading, okay, we want to protect that tissue so we don't get a tear and there's a difference there. Okay. And a diastasis isn't mm. necessarily the tear it's the separation. Okay. Ah, very interesting. Yeah. But I did not know that. That, mm -hmm. that, that being said, it's a natural process. Okay. Then when baby comes out, things, as they start coming back together, the abs come together and the separation should naturally close. And in most cases, diastases over time will naturally close up. 
Okay. Now, something else that people don't realize is if you've never checked to see like what your midline feels like, Mm -hmm. what's considered normal is between your right and left side of your abs is actually a two centimeter gap. So like your fingers, okay, like two fingers side by side is kind of considered normal. Now that might not be your normal. So if you're kind of going like, Oh my gosh, that sounds really wide. Like that might not be your normal. But unless you checked yourself before your very first pregnancy, you don't really know what your normal is. Okay, so that's something to know. Now, while we're pregnant, we have a hormone called relaxin, that's part of what helps our body to soften so everything can spread. And that's part of what's making everything get softer, and allowing things to spread without tearing. Okay, so we just get this big normal separation. Now, with that relaxin, we had when um, after pregnancy, it takes a while for that relaxin to get out of our body. And if we choose to breastfeed, we have another hormone called prolactin that kind of naturally keeps our body softer. And so as people are healing postpartum, until you're really done breastfeeding, I don't really worry about people's dioceses totally coming together because our bodies are just naturally softer. And this is something that if you're kind of thinking about like us weekly and getting your baby body back in like three weeks, it's just not (laughs) feasible. Okay. If you're breastfeeding your own child. Okay. And if you're, you know, doing a normal mom thing and don't have a ton of care, if you don't have a trainer and a cook and a full-time nanny and a night nurse and someone else feeding your kid, if you don't have like a full-time staff, your pre baby body come back or pre baby body coming back in three weeks. It's just not, it's just delusional. Yeah, okay. Three so just, months even. Yeah. Yeah. No. So you just, people need to be more gentle with themselves. Okay. Is my point here is like, just mm-hmm. be more gentle and realize that this is a t- process that takes time. Breastfeeding is great. So if you choose to do that, don't, you know, stop your breastfeeding journey earlier because you're worried about your diastasis. This will come back together eventually, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. there's things that we can be doing to help to manage it. So kind of what I already mentioned with the posture with pregnancy Mm -hmm. is if we are really pulled forward and really open on the front with these big, you know, flared ribs and this really dumped forward pelvis, you can imagine that that is going to further expand our abdomen. So working on helping to stack our ribs and our pelvis and have a more kind of neutral rib cage and more neutral pelvis while we're pregnancy pregnant as much as we can will help to keep a diastasis from being worse than it would be. That Mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Also, if we are exercising during pregnancy, which I hope you are Mm -hmm. looking for coning and doming. Okay. So we call it monitoring and modifying. Okay. So you watch your body. And if you see something that's causing you to cone or dome, whatever that activity is, just realize it's too much on your body and you don't persist with that activity. Yeah. So whether that's a crunch, whether that's a kipping pull up, whether that is a plank, doesn't matter. Okay. Whether that's just an overhead push. This is a really common one because people push overhead and they, and also your ribs pop back. Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. So watching, and you can use Mm -hmm. a mirror, you can set up your phones. You can kind of like use your phone as like something to videotape yourself and then look at it. If Mm -hmm. you have a coach, you can have them watching it. What we're looking for is a little midline bulging out. Okay. And if no, you I wish see I could show that, you guys because I can kind of make it happen. <laughs> if you see, and you, I'm, I'm prepared sure to pull my belly out on camera today, though. <laughs> if, if you go on, you know, on, on Google or something and you look up like yeah, honing and doming diastasis, I'm sure you can find just an yeah. easy little video of it. But if you see that along that midline, just know that you're, it's too much in your body right now. So modify the activity. So you're yeah. monitoring through that coning and doming. And maybe you're choosing a different exercise for the same muscles, but just that doesn't do that. So that's where we might have to, instead of doing an overhead press with, you know, with weight, maybe we're doing something without weight, seated, maybe we're changing our angle, Mm -hmm. we're we're reducing our weight, you know, so we may change our position, our weight, our rep scheme, do things like that. Or maybe yeah. just straight up, don't do that exercise, you know? Yeah. And I have realize- to take things a lot smaller. For me, it's like, you know, um, I mean, planks, I have to take shorter, you know, mm-hmm. for the like endurance of the strength. And then it's like leg lower and lifts. I actually could do it the last time around and I can't this time. But I just take it. I have to keep it really at a nice high angle. Mm-hmm. I even bent knees and all that kind of stuff. It's just um, 
you know, taking it much smaller. Are you struggling to find the time to get to the salon or spa for some much needed self-care? I know I am (laughs) with two kids at home. Well, Priv is an on-demand beauty and wellness solution located in over 30 cities across the U.S., Priv's services include professional hairstyling, makeup application, nail services, spray tanning, facials, massages, men's grooming, and even ear piercing. Simply open up your Priv app, select what service you'd like, your location, preferred day and time, and let Priv take care of the rest. Once your appointment is confirmed, a highly qualified professional will come to you to provide you a luxe, in-home, or on-demand service. Priv gives you the freedom and flexibility to schedule all of your beauty and wellness needs with one easy-to-use platform. Put self-care back into your schedule and book your Priv appointment. Download the Priv app today and use code SIMPLESEXY20. That's SIMPLESEXY20 to get $20 off your first service on the Priv app. So then what is the difference between the diastasis and a hernia yeah. And if we, I guess if we have the hernia, what I want to explain to people what the long term, you know, what happens with a hernia and I guess what we have to, what you should have to do for that. I just hear so many, I guess I just have a lot of women who their kids are older now and they didn't yeah. realize they had it. And now they're having core issues. They can't do some, they can't do a lot of fitness. Um, sure. And it seems like something that needs a medical treatment. So how do we know we're a year out and we're still seeing mm-hmm. what symptoms to know that this is a hernia instead? So when we, when someone comes in and we're looking at this and that someone who comes in might know that they're a pelvic floor patient. Okay. Or they might be coming in saying I've got back pain. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's mm-hmm. another really common thing. Yeah. Is people also come in and say my back hurts. I had a kid a couple of years ago and I, I feel fine. Okay. I feel fine. I'm back to everything normally, but my back hurts. That's a really common complaint. So they think that they're an orthopedic patient, but they're really a pelvic floor patient. Okay. Mm. And the two things are, are one and the same, really, you know, the pelvic floor is part of our core. And yeah. so the pelvic floor is something that's gender neutral. It does not matter what gender you are, you have a pelvic floor. Okay. But this is like this um, diastasis is part of the system, right? So when we have that, you might have someone reporting low back pain or hip pain, and it might be years out, all right? Another common thing is I get women who are postmenopausal, who are having urinary incontinence of some sort. Mm-hmm. And we go back and we start kind of tracking their symptoms back. And we track back to kind of postpartum. And mm-hmm. we go and I said, all right, well, let's check, you know, your midline, because what we're looking for is midline closure and stability. And we may see that they still have some coning doming or another way, in other words, like midline instability in the front. Mm-hmm. And if we have midline instability in the front, it's going to translate to the low back. And if I have midline instability in the front, or like literally think kind of almost like a, a hole in my my ability to maintain pressure, if you will, then that may lead to incontinence late down the road as well. So that could be something that is a more of an age related issue, but Mm -hmm. comes back to this kind of core instability and inability to manage pressure, which leads to kind of the stress urinary incontinence. And that's different. The stress urinary incontinence is the laugh, cough, sneeze kind of incontinence, not the like urgency where like you're racing to the bathroom because, you know, you like, have to go, have to go, have to go. That's a, a different type of incontinence. Yeah. Okay. Um, but with that stress incontinence, it's a really normal thing to have this midline instability. And it can last for years if someone didn't treat it properly or didn't know that they had it, you know, so just didn't close all the way or it closed, but never re- like really solidified and restabilized. Mm-hmm. But the difference between a diastasis and a hernia is we're looking with a diastasis at both width, but we're also looking at depth. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's important is that people always think about the width, but they don't think about how deep that diastasis goes as well. Well, imagine like if that goes really deep, or if you have a tear in that connective tissue, then material that comes from like your abdomen, that can kind of sneak through that connective tissue. And that's when we have a hernia. So Mm -hmm. say like if we have an abdominal hernia, that's when we have the tissue sneaking through and that could look like fat mass. But that could also look like a little bit of like intestines or something, depending on the size and the location of that hernia. And that is a different story altogether because we have that coming through. Now, not all hernias require surgery. Okay. We can a lot of times work on kind of pressure management and closure for people and maybe avoid a surgical procedure. 
or if somebody does have to have a surgery to have that closed, I really recommend to people that they talk to their doctors about non mesh procedures. Like, sorry, I lost my earbud. <laughs> um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I really encourage people to try not to do mesh if they can and talk to their doctors about other procedures that are available because there are hernia repairs that are available without. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you may need uh, physical therapy afterwards to help to stabilize again with that, you know, that hernia procedure to help to kind of get everything restabilized. But that's the main difference between a diastasis and hernia is a diastasis, you don't have anything popping through, you just kind of see that coning and doming a hernia, you actually have tissue coming through. That's amazing information, because truly, I did think that diastasis basically was a hernia, but then you had to repair it. And it was like the level of the hernia. So it's great to hear that. I mean, we're most of us will have that kind of stuff. It's about modifying, being aware of it, knowing what to look for, modifying to not make it worse and potentially mm -hmm. lead to a hernia. Um, also the wisdom afterward with like breastfeeding and all of that to make sure that if you are jumping into fitness too, you know, you're not doing something necessarily if you have still some major um, diastasis, like a CrossFit where you're like throwing your abs back, that kind of stuff too, and putting a lot of pressure yeah. just yet. Uh, so maybe like a Pilates, a yoga, more controlled intermix with something else um, really would be best for everybody, you know, but <laughs> and then adding your normal type of fitness. Yeah. And regardless of what your fitness is postpartum, yeah. it's the same thing. It's like that you're being aware of what your diastasis looks like and where you kind of have that those soft spots. And then again, monitoring and modifying. And as you're exercising and returning, that you're watching that regardless of what your exercise is. Mm -hmm. And realize too, that people can have a diastasis that have never had a child. I have a really good girlfriend. who's. I think I had it before know. though, too, from fitness. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think if you're in fitness, your abs are so tight all the time too. I've heard as well, somebody who actually, you can tell me if this is a myth. Yeah. If your abs are already so formed, so tight, I imagine that they would really, even during pregnancy, you're probably more prone to it because they're not stretching as much as somebody who maybe hasn't done 1 million sit-ups throughout their life. Do you know I if, don't the, if the I don't muscles know if won't that's stretch as proven. much? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's proven or not. But mm -hmm. if you kind of imagine that like genetically different people are predisposed to having different levels yeah. of tissue stretch also, I don't, yeah. so I'm not sure if I can say for sure that that's accurate or not only because mm -hmm. I don't know if that anyone's ever studied that and like really proven that theory, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you can kind of think like it makes intuitive sense, but whether it it's accurate or not, I'm not really <laughs> sure. <laughs> but that being said, genetics takes it is a huge thing to play with it. You know, like there's mm -hmm. a huge genetic, you know, um, predisposition, just like, you know, anything else, else with our connective tissue. And also, yeah. you know, to your point, your first pregnancy, you didn't have this and second pregnancy you do, you know, when you've already had some disruption to the tissue the first time around, the second time around, your body might kind of go, oh, well, I've already had a little damage. So now this time I'm going to have a little bit more, you know, and it just may not mm -hmm. have fully recovered in between. And we see that too. And every pregnancy mm -hmm. is different. You know, it's like one, you can have a really easy pregnancy and no problems. And then, you know, and that could be the first one. And then the second one's hard or vice versa. And so yeah. we see it all. Yeah. I, and I interrupted you. I think you were going to say something about your girlfriend. Sorry. Oh, no. What I was going to say is I have a girl, really good girlfriend who's a CrossFit athlete. And mm -hmm. she has a, a really big diastasis just from all of the kipping pull-ups and muscle-ups. Mm -hmm. And so she has to really watch it. She's never had a child. And so it's something, too, that you hear about this. And she could start seeing in, on videos this coning and doming. And so realize that although we all think about this as being a pregnancy issue, it doesn't have to be. And also... We see a lot of men who have this kind of problem. I was just going to say, I think this is something so. that my, I need to send my husband to you for <laughs> because he just had hip surgery actually, but, but a year mm. before all of that, he was complaining about low back pain and hip pain. Mm. And we just, you know, had a year where we just didn't have time to really take care of ourselves and do our fitness yeah. and we're just working. So it sounds like something that he may have. Well, yeah, we always check, check men for it too. So yeah, let's move on a little bit. And 
and um, get to the really fun stuff. So through my yoga training, I learned a lot of techniques to prep women for delivery. And you mentioned it like the breathing techniques were part of it. And they were very useful in the sense of doing yoga and teaching all these different breathing techniques and how long a contraction is obviously movement and hip opening, um, which really helped me. But one other thing that they really recommended was the perineal massage. And I may, I hope I said that right. Um, can you, it, but I was very intimidated and I did not do this the first time around. Um, most of the time they say like a partner can get in there and massage and you're going to explain what that means. And I was just like, okay, this is already too much for me. Um, but this time around, we are actually talking about it and I'm talking mm -hmm. about doing it to myself. We're going to, we haven't done it yet. We're going to get closer to it, uh, closer to the delivery. Um, well, you've taught me a little bit actually, but can you explain what it is and how it assists and, and then we can get into more details too. Yeah. So, okay. So the perineal body is that lump of skin that's between your vaginal opening and your anus. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's that, that lump of tissue, mm -hmm. that tissue is where most tears happen during mm -hmm. a vaginal birth. Not all tears. You can literally tear anywhere, not to scare oh, at people, God. but that is where we, the most, you know, the most common tear is. And it's also, if someone's going to have an episiotomy, it's where they do an episiotomy. Okay. So perineal massage is literally massage of that area. And that's kind of where the name comes from. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about massage of any other musculature, like think about your neck, like if I massage this, it's like I'm getting the musculature to relax, I'm bringing more blood flow to it. I'm helping that tissue to elongate and stretch. Oh, yeah. And kind of accept the ability to become longer. Perineal massage is very much the same as you're literally training this tissue to accept stretch. Mm -hmm. to elongate, get more blood flow there so that when it comes for the time for baby's head to crown and be coming out, that tissue has the ability to stretch. And the idea is, is if I'm elongating the bottom part of the vagina, because if you're thinking about this, like on a clock, and if yeah. I'm looking in between a woman's leg, kind of down mm -hmm. like the six o'clock portion. So yeah. if I'm elongating down here, okay, mm -hmm. I'm still increasing the overall circumference, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily like elongating up here, but I'm still increasing my overall circumference by elongating mm -hmm. down here mm -hmm. and allowing there to be more stretch for baby's head to come out. And a lot of people have heard the term of like ring of fire, where there's this moment where there's this natural kind of impulse to pause when baby's head is crowning. The idea there is that when we have that moment during vaginal delivery, it's a cue for a woman to pause and pushing to allow that tissue to have a moment to stretch around the baby's head yeah. before continuing to push out to allow for that moment of like letting the tissue expand. Yeah. Okay? Perineal stretching is kind of helping to assist in that moment where we're working on stretching that tissue beforehand and we're helping elongate it before we get there. So we don't usually start there that until like 30 weeks or maybe a little longer. Mm -hmm. And the way that I do it with patients is that if I have somebody's partner who's willing to assist, I think this is the easiest thing because for a woman at that point to be able to massage down in her vaginal opening and like in that, you know, val uh, vaginal vault, around a big pregnant belly is not the easiest thing. No, it's, it's too hard. We were, we were already, she was already demoing and I was like, <laughs> okay, this is, how could I even be able to do this? Yeah, and and I don't have T-Rex arms, but like. Yeah. <laughs> it's not undoable. There's tools yeah. and stuff that we can help to introduce. So if someone's yeah. partner is willing to help, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. And what I recommend is that people make this kind of a, a part of like a nightly ritual um, and they spend maybe like three, five, seven minutes, like depending mm -hmm. on a woman's tolerance, doing this just on a nightly basis. And what we're doing is teaching people how to properly do this massage with a partner or by themselves in working on doing this multiple times a week, because mm -hmm. doing one time a week you know, it's just not enough. It's just like when we're trying to elongate this tissue, it needs to be done, in my opinion, kind of more consistently. Mm -hmm. And so if I can have people doing it with partners at home, I say that people find um, more success with it um, when they're actually in delivery of having um, some more success. And the idea here is that we're either preventing tears or making tears much more minimal than they would have been otherwise. So by, by doing this as part of our birth prep. Um, the other thing that I like to incorporate is because perineal stretching and massage isn't totally comfortable. I mean, there is a little bit of discomfort involved, not pain, but 
stretching type of discomfort is mm-hmm. being able to start kind of incorporate that breathing breath work like yeah. that you might be doing for labor and delivery in with that because you're kind of simulating something causing some discomfort you know vaginally so you're working on managing the breath and working on managing that breathing as you've got that discomfort down there to kind of like mm-hmm. and I think too I mean I still I mean look I got to keep a little spice in my life here. So (laughs) we talked about it. I was like, and I feel like my husband would feel a little uncomfortable, although he would do that um, for me. But we talked about there's like some devices that you recommended. They're almost like longer sticks. It's kind of like lengthening your arm, lengthening your finger so that women can help to massage that area as well. Yeah, you could be using a dilator. Yeah. Sure. And we could, you know, a, we could teach you to do it with a dilator. Mm-hmm. There's also these things called pelvic wands. They're things to yeah. help to like elongate and reach around. But just kind of, you know, to your point with the spice is a lot of times people are kind of going, coming in here saying like, I haven't had sex with my partner in a few months. Like I just have no interest. Mm-hmm. And one of the interesting things about the perineal stretching and massage is that when people are doing that with a partner at home, a lot of times it leads into intimacy. And so okay. sometimes it actually mm-hmm. leads into that. And one of my yeah. favorite moments is when people come in and they're all awkward and kind of uncomfortable about learning this, right? And they come in and like, I'm essentially teaching their partner how to do this. And it's real <laughs> weird, especially for the partner. Cause I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Okay, You're used looking, to it. Yeah. We're yeah. looking at vaginas, <laughs> but here's, you know, this guy over my shoulder. Yeah. Being, right yeah <laughs> you, can, you can imagine like every oh time, i can see my know, husband yeah and i shouldn't say guy like but any partner it doesn't matter yeah. who the partner right they're just like like this is happening right so, <laughs> but when the woman comes in and they come in like a week or two later and they walk in my front door and i get like a literal high five and they're like we had sex and it was good right and this happens because they're like i haven't wanted to have sex forever but we were doing the perineal stretching and massage and you know one thing led to another and next thing i knew and i'm like awesome so i mean a lot of times in pregnancy we ha- aren't feeling all that sexy right we're yeah. not really feeling it but the number of times that this leads into intimacy and kind of <laughs> adds some spice back in you'd be actually really surprised <laughs> surprised that something that seems so clinical actually yeah. adds that back in and it it's really a trust Act, you know, activity with your partner. Uh, you know, You're kind I of, that. Yeah. you know, so it actually can be really nice in that way. And so for people mm-hmm. who are going like, my partner would never want to do this, like that might be yeah. your motivating factor, right? I might there. be fully wrong. Maybe you <laughs> Maybe reading this Consider. all wrong, actually. Food <laughs> <laughs> for thought. We'll tune in after the fact to find out. <laughs> It'll be post follow up. <laughs> All right. So let's say we're getting to the pre- the delivery and a mm-hmm. um, couple things like post-delivery. So we talked a bit about uh, diastasis recti. Well, I guess first yes. let's hit the fitness up. We talked about it a little bit. When do you recommend, maybe just in short, short bullet points since we did speak of it, to get back to fitness and what do you recommend? Just so first of all, you need review, to be cleared, yeah. you know, kind of cleared by your doctor for like things are good. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we want to make sure that kind of things are good. So you should have your postpartum um, check up with your OB like and weeks, usually yeah. that's around like six weeks or so. Okay. Now before six weeks, one of the things you can be doing is you can be walking and you can be holding baby and you can be doing some, um, some exercise, you know, doing a lot of, of walking. And a lot of times people talk about that first six, six weeks as being like the lying in period. And depending yeah. on who you talk to, some people are proponent of doing nothing. Now, personally, I would go mentally berserk if I did nothing. And so I tell my patients, you know, feel free to walk as much as possible. If people are feeling good, um, there's some really gentle exercises that sometimes I'll send people in that postpartum period because I'm usually not seeing people in that time. Um, mm-hmm. Just really gentle things that if you are seeing a pelvic floor PT and you're feeling good, that's something you could discuss with your pelvic floor PT. And but this is a, a not a one size fits all thing where you you know should just jump right back into exercise. But walking in that first six weeks is a really kind of Uh, you know, no brainer where you can just be up and walking and moving and walking, people poo poo it, but there's so many benefits with helping to stimulate your metabolism, helping to um, improve your circadian rhythm, uh, circadian rhythm, helping to stabilize your hormones, helping to reduce cortisol, you know, all of these things. And for, you know, moms, a lot of times, like, you know, babies having a hard time, maybe sleeping, you know, so that rocking motion to help baby to take a nap, you know, those Mm -hmm. are all like really positive things that people can be doing, you know, kind of right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Once you get approved by your OB or your midwife to then return to some exercise, then, you know, then we want to start working on restabilizing the abdomen, 
making sure your pelvic floor is, is engaging. And that's when you would want to come back and see a pelvic floor PT if you've got that person in your life. And we can check your pelvic floor, see what's going on with that musculature down there. And I don't recommend that people jump right back into Kegels, okay? Because here's the deal. If Kegels are yes. not right. Get right into everybody. the pelvic floor here, yeah. Yeah, so people think that like I have to do all these Kegels. Now, you don't. people don't realize that a vaginal birth may be a traumatic event. And say you didn't have a vaginal birth, say you had a C-section, that's mm -hmm. still a traumatic event. I mean, C-sections are a major abdominal surgery here. So either way, we may be needing to deal with scar tissue and that might be affecting ability to have stabilization, whether it's in the abs or in the pelvic floor and maybe having pain. We need to work on restabilization of the muscles. But with Kegels, if we have a pelvic floor that's actually too tight and tonic. So kind of imagine like my biceps is like stuck like this, doing a bunch of Kegels isn't going to help. Because of me. the trauma. The trauma. Okay. Yeah. And that trauma could be mm -hmm. simply nine months of a baby, like literally Pressure. pushing down on my pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden coming off my pelvic floor is like, oh my gosh. And it's get stuck in short, right? That could be the trauma. And it's yeah. kind of stuck in this like almost spasm and being tight and short. It could also be the trauma of baby actually coming through that pelvic floor and now being stuck up in spasm, right? So there's a couple of different reasons that could happen. And so sometimes we have patients who they literally can't relax their pelvic floor. And so until they learn how to elongate it, we shouldn't be teaching them how to contract it. And oh, that's be so telling, interesting. And we yeah. shouldn't be teaching how to do Kegels because it's going to just yeah. cause more pain and dysfunction because it's not a healthy, normal contraction. So that's a really good reason to see a pelvic floor therapist because we want to check and make sure, can you elongate and can you, can you contract? And think of it as like, vaginal agility, you know, muscle agility, like I should yeah. be able to elongate, I should be able to contract, I should be able to do that quickly. I should have yeah. some endurance and power. And honestly, I wish I, things. I wish I would have seen somebody or you mm -hmm. after the first one right away. I feel like every woman should just check it out, see what's going on. So you know where to start with what mm -hmm. exact traumas happened or nothing. So you know where yeah. to start with the healing of it. The Keep It Simple Sexy podcast is brought to you by KO Body Care. Right after I turned 30, something happened that I was not expecting. I noticed the skin on my body was aging faster than the skin on my face. Creepiness, sunspots, fine lines and wrinkles, they all seemed to creep up overnight. And then it hit me. I'd been using all sorts of powerful anti-aging ingredients in my face, but I wasn't doing the same for the skin on my body. So that's when I had that aha moment to create KO Body Care. KO is face grade body care, which means that it's pure and effective enough for the face, but formulated just for the body. We use the same ingredients as high-end clean skincare brands to help skin look smoother, brighter, firmer, and younger. The product that put us on the map was our Body Beautiful Cream. Beauty editors are obsessed with it because it combines clean, natural ingredients, omega oils, green tea, mangosteen, goji berry with clinical actives like hyaluronic acid and CoQ10. It leaves the skin feeling so hydrated, so smooth, so soft, and even gives your collagen production a boost. So are you ready to see what face grade body care can do for you? Then go to kobodycare.com. For our first time users, use the special code KISS20 for 20% off your purchase. And this kind of brings up to some, of, we can just talk about it all in once. It's just the last little topic we have here post-pregnancy, but which was the leakage that I talked about. Hi, I'm Christine Bullock. And I sometimes pee my pants. And most of my <laughs> girlfriends basically say the same thing, but what a pain mm -hmm. in the butt. I mean, yeah, it's embarrassing, but it's just like more so like a, just a, such a pain. Yeah, um, it's very inconvenient. And, yeah, it's inconvenient. And so um, this is obviously part of the pelvic floor issues um, that women have or trauma that they have too. And what's interesting, and I know you'll get into this, but we have like a little gadget. It was like a game that you gave me. It's like a little contraption, a little game, um, mm -hmm. that, which you can tell about. But what I think is very interesting is that like, it's really fun, ladies. I've been showing all my girlfriends. It's like, you know, yeah, it's like Mario Brothers, basically, with your <laughs> vagina, and I played a trick on my husband. Actually, I was look, I just was like looking at the game, controlling the little guy, like eating the little lotus, avoiding the birds and stuff like that. And he's like, how are you doing this? 
<laughs> and and you're like, wow. where's my magic vagina? Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's so cool because there is a part that is the full release. And I didn't realize mm-hmm. sometimes you just have to, it, the bird just kind of sits or whatever it is on the bottom for a while because it makes you relax for so long. I'm like, why do I have to relax for this long? Mm-hmm. But I now see why so that we can fully get to that point, what you're saying um, too. But imagine so many funny stories about this game, but well, imagine people like you and your friends who are afraid of leaking, you know, it's like you, if you walk around and you're afraid of leaking and you're walking around like this all the time, it's like walking around like this all the time. And you wouldn't walk around like this. So why would you walk around like this if your pelvic floor contracted? It's not healthy. So we need to be able to teach people that relaxation. And to your point, the game that you're talking about is when people come in, like women come in and they have a a pelvic floor that it's, you know, it's appropriate for me to be teaching them how to be doing pelvic floor strengthening as part of their program is that I will, um, I like to use um, these different biofeedback devices in my practice for people to be using at home. And the one that you're specifically talking about is one called the PeriFit. And they're literally biofeedback like vagina games. So you have an insertable vaginal device that connects via Bluetooth to your phone or whatever smart device you're using. And you literally get um, tactile contact from the intervaginal device. So you get tactile feedback then you also get visual feedback from the the, um, the game. And so you're getting multiple ways to know that you're actually doing um, the Kegel correctly and that you're actually being able to control those pelvic floor muscles. And the PeriFit's nice because it also helps you to know if you're using your co-contractors like your ab- um, abdominal muscles too much. So it really helps people to take some of the guesswork out of doing them at home. Mm-hmm. And also I think it helps with people's compliance because you feel more confident. It's actually kind of fun. Yeah. And it's so, so much fun. I <laughs> hate video games. Did not like watching my boyfriend grow up play Zelda. And I am so into this and competitive with myself. <laughs> I haven't thought about Zelda in so long. But yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of fun. And so yeah. it's, you know, not the only part of your program, obviously. But as a component of, I like to use that because if people can be strengthening their pelvic floor and then strengthening and use, like, strengthening the rest of the system, learning breath work, working on posture, and then we can kind of put this together as a functional thing. I like to use it as part of the pelvic floor therapy as a tool. And it's really nice because then it's something that you can be doing as part of your home management too. And I can tell the difference almost right away, like just a little bit more control. And I will say too, Mm -hmm. as a a trainer for so many years, what I love is at the end, it'll give you your your numbers and Mm -hmm. there's like endurance, like power, full strength. So you get all these reads on an agility because sometimes you mm-hmm. have to squeeze really strong, really fast. And then sometimes you also have to release really fast. Sometimes it's a little bit more of a gauge for you. So you get so much control. So I'm just going to say this to the ladies, like, hello, better at sex, better for you, better for them. <laughs> and, you know, looking into whether you've had babies ever or not, if you're never going to work a muscle, you're going to potentially have issues in the future. And I, mm-hmm. you know, I hear from so many women in their seventies and eighties, like many more mm-hmm. issues that I just, I, it's like, again, a pain that I don't need to deal with. <laughs> so if I can do something, I mean, look, the upkeep is a lot. Sometimes it's radio frequency for my face at night. Sometimes it's my gua sha. <laughs> and now I have to take care of my vagina as well, <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> Sure. But, you know, we should really be che- treating our vaginas like our faces. Like think about how much time we spend here. Right. Yeah. And like, think about like how much upkeep we really need down there. And this is just part of that. You know, we should be really treating our, our vaginas much more like we treat our faces with, yeah. you know, serums and, and we like should be treating work. it with. Yeah. Yeah, down to, down to work. Like, everything. No, I mean, somebody should... compared it one time to that for me. Like, because there's the <laughs> lasers out there too, which I will say, this is very different, guys, than the mm-hmm. pelvic floor. I thought if I got the laser, like the Mona Lisa or whatever, that would help. And I got multiple afterwards and it did mm-hmm. not help whatsoever. Completely different about what that is going to do as opposed to leakage issues and pelvic floor and all of that. It's great. It was helpful. But somebody said like, you should be doing that like once a year too, whether you've had a baby or not, because it is like dental work for the skin, the tissue down there. And anyway, that's a whole other. (laughs) That's a whole nother thing with like, you know, vaginal atrophy and, you know, tissue, et cetera. But that's different than like the leaking and whatnot. The the more muscular part (laughs) of it. 
Well, thank you so much. Um, I welcome. have some speed round questions for you really All quick. Right. <laughs> so when do you feel your most beautiful, your most sexy? When I'm doing something that involves, that requires me to be strong. So um, I feel the most sexy when I'm doing something that involves a decent amount of athleticism and kind of pushes me. So that might be skiing downhill, that might be powerlifting, that might be paddleboarding out in the middle of the ocean, but something that really kind of involves me, yeah. you know, being outside and, and being fit and strong. That's kind of probably when I feel at my best. I love that. I feel that way a little bit. I feel that way actually a lot too, but it's, I feel like that's very California too, <laughs> but I, I dig it. <laughs> what is one thing that you're currently working on improving in your life? Oh, my work stress management. It's oh, my work yeah. boundaries are not the best and constantly a source of stress and something that I'm working on for sure. <laughs> work life balance. Work in progress. We all are. Yes. And then can you remember <laughs> one simple change you made in your daily habits that made a huge difference for you and the rest, you know, and the rest of your ha healthy habits? So I take magnesium, a lot of magnesium every day. And this is probably a weird one, but um, hmm. taking magnesium and like a high dose magnesium every day um, is probably one like healthy habit that I do daily without fail. And it helps a ton. Um, people don't realize how much magnesium deficiency a lot of us have. Mm -hmm. And magnesium helps with so much from our sleep to our hormone production to stress management. And, you know, for me, like with stress management, it's huge um, with, you know, bowel management, uh, nerve and muscle recovery. And it is one of the things that um, when I started doing that consistently and just was stayed on top of it has made a huge difference in my sleep and my stress, my ability to have kind of a normal digestive system. And it's been a massive change for me. And so that's something that I stick to completely. And I recommend <laughs> to a lot of my patients also. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. And I can see we do hear about magnesium and balance so much mm -hmm. so often. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gass. I was so excited to have you on because the ladies need to hear this stuff. Sometimes the men, the pelvic floors, helping the ladies out, whatever, you know, gender it is. neutral Pre topic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pregnancy and motherhood can be hard enough without all these annoying side effects. So thank you for educating us on how to repair, assist, prevent all of that. I'm so excited to personally be working with you through this pregnancy too. And I should say too, that with the pelvic floor, like you need that strength to push the baby out too. So you um, need to have the ability to have an athletic yeah event. get the baby out when <laughs> when when I need to where can we um find you to and follow you for more information sure so my website is www.mountain2cpt.com and you can find me on social media at mountain 2 c so it's actually m t n 2 s e a p t um, is my work and i think you flashed up my personal one too either one's fine but personal is like mostly photos of my boyfriend and my dog <laughs> so dog is so good. he's a, he she's always there he's always there right during yeah, our, our pt literally session literally sleeping next to me right now <laughs> but yeah the um, mtn to sea pt is the professional on instagram uh, facebook we'll and whatever else yeah no It'll be there feed. well thank you so much <laughs> i'll see you next week personally and thank, thank you, you so much thanks for having me on Yes. And thank you everybody for morning. tuning in. Oh, you too. Thank you everybody for tuning in. I can't wait to hear your feedback and comments in today's episodes. We appreciate your reviews and they honestly keep us getting all these amazing experts. So thank you. It makes me so happy. I could pee my pants. I just had to add that in there, guys. Have questions you need answered? Text me at 1-310-361-8697. Make sure you're following me on social at Christine Bullock have a healthy, happy week.